Declan Hunt singing the Cahal Brewer song. 93 years ago this week, the most high-profile victim of the Civil War, Cahal Brewer, a 1916 veteran, former chief of staff of the Irish Volunteers, subsequently the IRA, and minister for defence, lost his life. On the 5th of July, 1922, he charged from the Granville Hotel in Sackville Street, now O'Connell Street, and was shot and seriously wounded, and he died a few days later. But what prompted him to make such a dramatic last stand, and what of his impact and legacy? Well, to tell us more, we're joined by German Ferrer, Professor of Modern Irish History at UCD. Uh, German, good morning. Good morning, Pat. This is a one fascinating man. Oh, he really was. He was remarkably intense, remarkably committed, and remarkably difficult, I think it has to be said. Um, and that's why he was where he was on the 5th of July, 1922. He would not brook any kind of compromise. And it's the culmination. He was 47, nearly 48 at that stage. The culmination of a short but very intense life. Yeah. Let's talk about his beginnings, though. He was born into, uh, obviously, a nationalist family. He licked it up uh, at the dinner table. But he had a mixed background. He did, and that was what was interesting about it. I mean, it was a very, very big family. He was the tenth of 14 children. And his father was a Protestant and was an antique dealer. That was his business. His mother was a Catholic. But all of the children were raised as Catholics. And his father was also a fervent Parnellite, a follower of Charles George Parnell. And it has been suggested his father could have been in the Fenian movement also. So very intensely nationalist family. Um, and he was particularly preoccupied with religious observance from a very, very early stage. So he takes that side of his identity very, very seriously. And... Obviously, he is growing up in that particular environment in, in Fairview in the late 19th century that is hugely preoccupied with the nationalist movement, with the possibilities that are there. But he's also somebody who is a remarkable athlete. And if you look at the range of his athletic endeavour in his early years, and something his, his brother, one of his brothers, talked about at a later stage, he had this remarkable range. He was a boxer. He was a swimmer. He was a gymnast, he played cricket, he played rugby. And so he's not quite the Gale he becomes at a later stage. He schooled originally in Dominic Street and then he becomes a Belvedere boy. So he really is a great all-rounder. He's small and he's wiry and he's very, very determined, but quite clearly a uh, supreme athlete. Now t tell me about his time at Belvedere, because he had to leave, didn't he? His father's business got into trouble. Yeah, he was planning to go into medicine. And he was planning on staying in education as long as he could. And then his father's business went belly up and he was only 16 at that time so he had to come out and again considering the size of the family uh, there was a need for financial support there so he became a clerk for a a business a, a church a candle making a church candle making business um, and he stayed at that for a while but interestingly he got to the stage where he was not prepared to work for an English company and what had happened was he became a clerk and then a travelling salesman for that mm -hmm. company but at a later stage he was involved in an endeavour to establish an indigenous Irish candle-making candle -making company, Lawler, the two Lawler brothers he went into business with. And that was his business and remained his business throughout his career. And, and even during the War of Independence, he was still... They kept making candles. Yeah, and he was still working as a travelling salesman. Um, his wife, where did he meet her? He met her, of course, in the Gaelic League. And this is one of the interesting things about the socialisation of, of that generation. Very preoccupied, uh, Cahill Brewer was uh, with the Gaelic League, which is why he became Cahill Brewer. He was Charles Burgess. Uh, but he, he becomes uh, president of a particular branch of the Gaelic League. And at Burr, in Offaly, what was then Kings County, he met his wife, and she was a very intense uh, nationalist and advocate for the revival of the Irish language. And that wasn't uncommon during that period for, for men and women to mix very freely in those circles. Yes. Uh, and, of course, they were very, very much of the same mind. Now, when did he become active in republicanism? He's there from a, an early stage with the Gaelic League, which I think really politicises him. Uh, he joins the IRB, we know that in 1908, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, so he's committed to that secret, oath-bound uh, Republican organisation. And then, of course, he's a very active champion of the Irish Volunteer Organisation as it evolves from 1913, the end of 1913 onwards. We know he played a leading role, for example, in the leading the column that brought in the arms from Hoth. From Hoth. So he's involved in, in, in that endeavour. And again, you can see during that period that he is becoming very preoccupied with the military side of what might be coming. 
And that ultimately culminates, of course, in a leading role that he plays in the yeah. 1960s. Where was he garrisoned in 1960? He was in the South Dublin Union, what is now James's Hospital. That was a very important post during the 1916 Rising, and he's second in command to Eamon Kant. And he really distinguishes himself during that week. On Thursday in particular, Thursday of Easter week, there was a fierce battle to take control of the South Dublin Union. And the, the injuries he received were such that he was not expected to survive. And he had refused, he, also in this case, not to retreat with the rest of them. Uh, no surrender. You know, that is the hallmark of Cahill Brewer. And Eamon Kant found him, you know, in a pool of blood, still clutching his pistol, taunting his attackers and singing God Save Ireland and he was dying. Uh, that's how committed uh, and fervent he was and how brave he was and he had no intention of, of giving up and he was not expected to survive. Now what's happening after that is interesting because obviously a lot of the uh, leaders or people in senior positions were rounded up and deported. Uh, Colin Rua escapes that because of the severity of his injuries. He's treated in a number of different hospitals. Mm -hmm. He was left with a permanent limp. But he was discharged on the grounds that he didn't have any hope of recovery and by then, uh, the order for his capture had expired. So he's basically sent away to live out uh, the remainder of his life with his injuries. But he survives. Now, he's a permanent limp, and he's in constant pain because of the shrapnel and the bullet wounds and everything else. But he, he stays around. He survives to become a very, very active organiser of the Irish Volunteers in the aftermath of uh, the 1916 Rising. And he was actually arrested again in 1917 for advocating the release of all political prisoners. Yeah. So he endured another short period of imprisonment. Now, he became Chief of Staff of the Irish Republican Army. Uh, he was, I, I think, one of the architects of uh, the, the early constitution, wasn't he? The constitution of the... the Champagne and... Uh, well, what happens there is, is interesting in the aftermath of, of the 1916 Rising. Sinn Féin reorganises in 1917, and the question then is, who is going to control the military wing and the political wing? You know, so you have Sinn Féin and the Irish Volunteers. Colin Brew was in a position as Chief of Staff of the Irish Volunteers, what is evolving into the IRA, where he has to try and deal with that relationship between the Volunteers and the Sinn Féin movement. And he's always quite sceptical. Uh, of politics, but he realises there is a need for unity. So ultimately... So was he the Jerry Adams of his time? Uh, I suppose you could look at it in that way, uh, but what he's concerned with ultimately is unity and discipline. So when you talk about the, uh, the constitution of the IRA, what he wants is for members of the IRA, and this is what he proposes in 1919, to swear an oath of allegiance to the Republic and to the Doyle, so that they, that they will be under effective control. And that's problematic not all members of the IRA take that particular oath. And he does have this difficult relationship with the Sinn Féin movement. Now, uh, he presided over the first meeting of the Doyle oh. because of the absence of others. That's right, because Arthur Griffith and, and de Valera are not available. They're imprisoned. And he presides over that. It's a very, very important occasion, you know, the, the proceedings of, of the first Doyle. But again, he's there because of the absence of others. It's not a position he really wanted to focus on. He wants to focus on the military side of things. He was quite uncomfortable in that particular role. But what happens then is that when de Valera returns as president in April 1919, he assumes the position, Brewer assumes the position of the Minister for Defence. Again, that is where it gets very difficult. Now, Michael Collins, of course, uh, is seen as, the, the, if you like, the, the military leader. Yet you have a minister for defence, Colin Brew. They did not get on. It was a love lost between the two of them. And you can trace this now in, in a variety of very tetchy correspondence between the two. The bottom line is this. Who is in control of the IRA? and the strategy of the IRA and the activities of the IRA? Colin Brew, as minister for defence, believed that... Michael Collins is impinging on his brief. Yeah, that he is director of intelligence, Collins, for the IRA, but that the Minister for Defence should have an overall coordinating role. He's not getting that, and that inevitably leads to tension. He also is a very different kind of character to Michael Collins. Collins was very socially at ease. He's very charming. He's very good with people. Brewer isn't. Brewer could be kind and could be generous, but he's very austere, he's often seen as quite aloof. And the way Frank O'Connor, the great Irish writer, described it, he was the North Pole to Collins' equator. And it's an interesting description of the two of them. So there's personality issues there, but that more importantly than that is, can Cahill Brewer exercise the control over defence policy? And uh, there's a very interesting uh top-level meeting of the IRA in 1920, the War of Independence looming or underway. And Carl Brewer's position is that he was against ambushes of Crown forces unless there was first a 
called, called surrender. lay down your arms and surrender. He wanted that. What happened? Now, Pyrrhus Beasley, who was active in the IRA during this period, later dismissed Cahill Brewer as being hopelessly out of touch with the reality of the conflict on the ground. And that was an example of yes. it. You know, the idea that this was fine in theory and was quite noble. You call for a, a, a surrender uh, before. And, uh, you know, and if they refuse to surrender, then you take what actions you, you deem necessary. But as far as those fighting on the ground are concerned, that is not remotely practical. It doesn't correspond to the pressures that they are experiencing and, and the pressures that they are under, and it's not the right strategy. And it's an example of that, that, that tension between those devising policy and those who are fighting. Now, he also advocated moving the, the, the war uh, into England, uh, particularly, uh, but it was opposed by Collins. He was, and th this was a pet project that has gone right back to 1918. If you look at the conscription crisis of 1918, when the British government was threatening to impose conscription on Ireland, his reaction to that was to himself, with 12 volunteers, go to London and plan to assassinate cabinet ministers. So you take the war over to the mainland. And he still had that idea that that could be an effective strategy and would generate much more propaganda victories for the Republican movement. Others, of course, disagreed very strongly. But there, there are also tensions for another reason, and that's membership of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Cahill Brewer left the Irish Republican Brotherhood after 1916 because he believed that one of the reasons for the failure of the 1916 Rising was that the IRB was operating in secrecy and the volunteers was there. The Irish volunteers yeah. were there. And he didn't want to repeat of that during the War of Independence. He didn't think to be a member of the IRB and the IRA uh, was compatible. And again, Michael Collins obviously is a senior member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, so there's tension over that as well. Now, what happened with the Civil War? Um, he opposed the uh, Anglo-Irish uh, Treaty, of course. Um, but when it came to uh, setting two against the, the government of the day, the new government, what was his position? I mean, was he in favour of all-out war? No, he wasn't. He is in that difficult position in early 1922 where he's not quite sure what line to take. I mean, his position on the treaty has been absolutely clear. He was originally invited to be part of the delegation. He was having none of it. He stayed behind with Austin Stack and, and Eamon de Valera. He regards what Arthur Griffith and Collins have done in compromising with Britain as treacherous. And he sticks the rhetorical knife into Michael Collins during the treaty debates. He accuses him of being a minor player in the War of Independence who has exaggerated his role. This goes back to the tensions, you know, from, from the yeah. War of Independence period. He says he has been uh, duped by sensational press coverage. And he accuses Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins of being the weakest men on the negotiating team when they face Britain in the treaty negotiations. He really goes too far. And even a lot of anti-treaty uh, candidates or anti-treaty uh, Republicans in the door with him felt that he had gone too far. So that did more damage to him than it did yeah. to Colin. And, and it, 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 it is alleged that some of them who might have voted against the treaty changed sides that because has, of the ferocity yeah, of the yeah, attack. Perhaps one or two did. So th that was an indication, I suppose, of, of, of how fervent he was. But that creates its own dilemma in early 1922. Does that mean that Cottle Brewer is going to go with the diehards like Rory O'Connor and Lee Mellows? Is he going to advocate the IRA engage in a military coup? And he's against that. And what he believes is that the most important thing is not political, is military. There needs to be discipline maintained in the army and that they need to come together to relieve their suffering comrades in, in Northern Ireland. So that would have been his preferred option. Yeah. He said he was sick of politics. He doesn't get involved in the, the pact that's agreed around the election of June of 1922. He is elected as a TD uh, in Waterford, but he's not interested. And then he comes around to the idea that because of the original oath to the Republic that members of the army have taken, that they are justified in taking a stance and they are justified in resisting what is now becoming the free state. But when they, uh, the IRA occupied the forecourts, he uh, was arguing against it. He tried to he persuade was. them he to... Was. Because, again, he, he didn't believe that that was going to be an effective uh, strategy. Oscar Trainer uh, is involved in this, in trying to coordinate IRA activities in Dublin as well. And, you know, what Oscar Trainer suggests is that, OK, if they're not going to get out of the forecourts, we need to have some kind of backup, so let's try and take over O'Connell Street. So that, you know, if there is pressure on the forecourts, there'll be some line of retreat. And that's why Carl Brewer turns up for duty. Yeah. At that, at that stage, early in July, the shelling of the Four Courts begins at the end of June. Uh, and that's why he finds himself in that position. And what they were doing in Dublin was they were taking over the Granville Hotel, the Gresham Hotel. Again, it's, it, it's like going back to a strategy from previous years. 
and I suppose waiting really for the first day to attack him. And he then, on the 5th of July, orders his own men to surrender, but he's not for surrendering himself. No, there's no way he's going to surrender, and he comes storming out onto the street that is now named after him, Calabro Street, uh, was named so in 1932, and he's shot in the thigh. And there are two conflicting accounts of that injury. One is that if medical treatment had been given to him more urgently, he might have survived. Others have dis dismissed that and said that because such uh, an artery was severed, yeah. uh, that he wasn't going to survive. Um, either way, it was quite clear that he, at that stage, was you know the most high-profile victim of the early stages uh, of the Civil War. And when you look at... He was taken to the Matter Hospital uh, and died shortly afterwards. And when you look at the reminiscences of those who were involved in military activity on the Free State side at that time, at a later stage... Some of them looked back and felt that Cahill Brewer should not have been shot, that they should have waited until he had exhausted his ammunition and then taken him in as a prisoner, but that some of the younger, new recruits to the National Army were far too trigger-happy. Now, that might be a bit of wishful thinking also, but you can see that there was great sorrow at the idea that Cahill Brewer, who had been such an important character from 1916 onwards, had met his end that way. Yeah. Well, he's buried in Glasnevin Cemetery, and uh, he died 93 years ago on this day. German Ferger, uh, Professor of Modern Irish History at UCD, thank you very much for joining us. But now with